the Germans and the Japanese had surrendered, but I mean, we just went from one war to another. We just went to another one that everyone was too afraid to fight. It was still a war, you know, and that didn't end until 1989. And for, by some miracle, God only knows why, you know, it never degenerated into a thermonuclear exchange. And it was close, man. We just barely squeaked through that. There, was, there were two times during that period, one in 1964 during the Cuban Missile Crisis, where they had those bloody ICBMs primed. And so the way they worked was in the control panel, which kind of looked like a Star Trek, you know, the old Star Trek sets. There'd be like a panel here, and there was a little place you could put a key, then about 20 feet over there, there'd be another guy with a key, and if he turned his key and held it for 10 seconds at the same time, he turned his key and held it for 10 seconds, then the missile launched. And an intercontinental ballistic missile is a bullet, and, and I mean that technically. It's not a guided missile. Once you launch it, like you, you shoot a bullet, it's gone. You don't get to tell the bullet to come back once it's gone. You, you can turn around like a cruise missile. An intercontinental ballistic missile, it goes where you aimed it, and you don't get to bring it back. And so during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the keys were in the locks. So we were 10 seconds away. Man, I tell you, that was a tight keyhole. We barely squeaked through that one. And it looks like by about 1989, that, that, that collective consciousness, or Jung would say the collective unconscious of the human race, had decided that, well, maybe having it all end in like apocalyptic annihilation wasn't necessarily for the best. It's interesting because writers like Goethe, he wrote Faust, and Faust is this tale of a man who makes a, a bet with the devil so that he can acquire infinite knowledge, essentially. And the devil in, in Faust is named Mephistopheles. And Goethe was trying to explain what human evil, or evil per se, what its motive was. And he did a lovely job. It's so smart what he said. He said, the devil's basic hypothesis, and of course Goethe expresses this in poetry, is that life is so unbearably cruel and, and random and tragic that it would be better if it had never existed at all. And you know, you believe me, there'll be times in your life where you think that, you know, where something has just knocks you off your feet in a completely un, unjust manner, you know. And that thought, it'll rise up and like, it's a compelling thought, and I think that's the thought that human beings were wrestling with. Well, we've been wrestling with it forever, but we didn't really vote on it till 1989. You know, and life barely won. And, you know, life is a troublesome business. It's, it's a tragedy. And, you know, everyone asks themselves now and then is if their consciousness is worth the pain. Well, the answer to that is it depends on how you live. That is the answer to that. But, you know, that's a complicated answer. And, and just because you know that answer doesn't mean that you know how to live. Anyways, what's happened since 1989, as far as I'm concerned, is that intellectuals, who, who are often possessed by the worst sorts of demons, because they actually think that their intelligence can guide them properly in, in, in like the complex moral landscape. It's, it's not the case. You see most intellectuals, and this is certainly the case of most intellectuals in the universities, and in the, especially in the late 20th century, they were committed Marxists, like way past when they should have been. You know, George Orwell, by 1955, he was a left-winger, brilliant guy. He'd already figured out that whatever was going on in the Soviet Union was not good. So, you know, like if you had your eyes open, you were done with that by, you know, 10 years after World War II. But people like Jean-Paul Sartre were members of the Communist Party way longer than they had any ethical right whatsoever to be. You know, it's a, it was an absolutely murderous philosophy. And but. But intellectuals toyed with that. They still toy with it in the universities, you know, except it's turned into postmodernism, which is Marxism under a new guise. You know, and a lot of the, the postmodern thought is not only left-wing disguised, but it's also nihilistic. And that's actually the other problem that the death of God produces. One is, okay, I, I don't have a religious foundation. I don't have any foundation under my feet to buttress my moral claims, or even to sort of help me determine what life is worth in the face of tragedy. So I need something to replace that, and then poof, that's the state, which is a really bad replacement. Because if you think God's bad, like, you just try Stalin on for, try, on for size for a while. And Mao as well, you know, and Hitler as well. It's not like this was a phenomenon that was 
only linked to one, say, culture of people. Everybody became susceptible to it. And the same murderous thing happened every time people tried that. So it was China, Cambodia, Vietnam. Like wherever the communists got into power, man, people died by the hundreds of thousands. So Paul Pot, the guy who emptied the Cambodian cities and killed 7 million, sorry, I think it was 3 million people. He got his, he got his graduate degree at the Sorbonne in France. And he said what he was going to do when he went back to Cambodia. You know, he didn't outline the whole murderousness element, but he certainly had all the theory laid down in his fine French academy. So, you know, we mess with ideas in the universities. And if we don't do it properly, like people die, it's important to get your ideas right. So, one answer to the death of God is you worship the state. The other is you worship nothing. It's, it's nihilism. There's no distinction between anything. And everything is pointless. And there, there's a massive strain of that sort of underground theorizing in postmodernism. And a psychoanalyst, especially a Jungian, would look at the postmodern response, which is nihilistic, and the fascist response, which is sort of recourse to the state, as motivated by something even deeper than that. And that's the sort of process that Nietzsche was describing. Now, for Jung, he wrote a book called Ion, for example, and if you want to have nightmares for the rest of your life, that's a really good book to read. I mean, it's a, it, that book just terrified me, because Jung, what he did in that book basically was investigate the fantasy that he believed that all of Western civilization had been predicated on for the last 4,000 years. Now, because Jung really believed that what drove human beings was, and it, it's a Piagetian perspective in some weird ways, was the revelation of the successive unconscious revelation of fantasies were at the forefront of the, our movement into unknown territory. So it's like there's unknown territory, and then there's known territory, but there's this weird intermediary space between them. And that intermediary space where you kind of know but kind of don't know, that's where your imagination plays. And of course that's the case, right? Because when you encounter something and you really don't know much about it, you imagine what it might be. And so it takes on the structures of your imagination. And so in some sense, what you're dealing with as you move through history, you expand your domain of knowledge into the unknown, is you encounter your own fantasy. Anyways, if you want to know about that, you could read like volume 9 and 9. 9.1 and 9.2 of Jung, one's called Archetypes of the Collective Unconscious, and the other's called Ion. But, like, it'll take you a while to crack them. You have to beat your head against those books quite a bit, because what, what Jung is outlining in some sense is so shocking, it's almost impossible to grasp. Once you get the picture, all of a sudden things flip around, because you understand what he's talking about. But before then, man, it's, it's, it's tough going. It's funny, because Jung has been... Uh, there was a guy named Richard Knoll who wrote a biography of Jung. And he was a jealous guy, I think. And he was crooked, too, because his book was called The Aryan Christ, and he used, like, Nazi imagery on the cover. And it was his publisher that talked him into doing that because he thought the book would sell more. It's like, you don't do that. Well, or if you do, that indicates really what you're up to, right? Because of, the, because of what you're willing to allow to happen to your work. So anybody who would have thought about that wouldn't have used Nazi imagery to gain economic utility out of writing a criticism of Jung because it's, it's, it's a crooked maneuver. So then you have to think, okay, what's, what's he up to? Why is he doing this? Now, Jung has been so... He accused Jung, for example, of basically starting a cult. And I can understand that. But what I found so amusing about Noel's book is that what Jung was actually up to was so much more so much more terrifying than a mere cult that it was sort of like accusing a, uh, like a serial killer of stealing a loaf of bread. It's like, yeah, well, maybe he stole a loaf of bread, but compared to what he was actually up to, it's, it's really not relevant. So, I mean, Jung was trying to bring the primordial imagination back into the world and to make people conscious of it. It's like, whew, that's something, man, really. That's really something. So, that reading, I read everything you wrote, except the books that were like published after his collected works. I read some of those. It took me a long time. And it just tore me into bits. Like, I didn't know what the hell, which way was up halfway through those books. I mean, Nietzsche's bad enough because Nietzsche will set out to destroy your presuppositions. 